What makes humans distinct from other animals? Biologically, we have similar hardware to other animals like chimps and gorillas. Arms, legs, eyes, ears, brains, etc. We also have the same operating system of basic instincts as other animals that tell us what to do. We instinctively search for food, find a mate to procreate with, and seek the company of others. So, if the hardware and the operating system are the same or very similar with our closest relatives like apes and monkeys or even mammals, then what makes human different? The answer lies in the software or our psychology, but more specifically in our ability to tell stories. Carl Jung, the Swiss genius psychoanalyst, looked at humans from different cultures and continents and discovered something extraordinary. We all have very similar myths and stories, religious and non-religious. Now, how is it possible that humans with little or no contact with other humans produce the same myths, stories, or characters? He realized that we share the same hidden software, our collective unconscious. In the early days of human evolution, our software or psychology was shaped by our ancestors, and therefore our psychology resonates with certain stories and characters. These collective memories are sewn into our human DNA, which makes us different from other species. Not only that, we have produced a sophisticated language to communicate these myths and stories to others and future generations. So today I'll talk about Carl Jung's life, core philosophical psychological ideas, and finally ten philosophical secrets we can learn from him. So get yourself some Swiss cheese and let's psychoanalyze how bacteria turn sour milk into delicious food. Joking aside, let's talk how Jung poked hole into the human psyche to understand our deeper layers of our past hidden memories stored and our capacity for storytelling we have inherited from our early ancestors. Carl Jung was born in 1875 in Switzerland. Just like Friedrich Nietzsche's father, Jung's father was a church pastor and his mother also came from a family of religious clergymen. While his father was a dignified, academically inclined, and stern man symbolizing stability, his mother suffered from depression. She saw ghosts and spent time away in hospitals due to mysterious illnesses. Therefore, she represented chaos or unreliability during her childhood. As a result, the little Carl spent long hours alone and became deeply introverted and solitary. Although he would observe the marital conflict between his parents, he would also spend long hours in his own imagination, developing vivid, clearly organized worlds that contrasted the outside chaos. This is a common characteristic among great novelists, whose imaginations see things ordinary people either don't see or don't have the time to see. In fact, he later articulated his main idea of individuation, in which each individual's task is to develop consciousness from the chaos of the unconscious. A good analogy would be a volcano that looks beautifully symmetrical on the surface, but at the same time it rises from the depth of chaos down below. So individuation is a similar process in which a person develops his or her own idea of the self from the chaos of the unconscious memories we have inherited from our ancestors. As a young boy, he witnessed religious rituals and ceremonies due to his own family being involved. On his maternal side, the family was involved in religious occult activities. He also drew a parallel between a child making crafts and these religious or occult activities. For example, he himself crafted a figure at the end of his pencil that resembled a religious totem, a symbol of calm and comfort. Children get attached to certain objects, for example a security blanket, a toy or something else, which they bring with them everywhere they go and even hug the item while asleep. He realized this was similar to religious ceremonies and rituals that humans do without really asking the questions why. We just do it. This became the basis of his theory of the collective unconscious, meaning we are born with certain memories passed down from our deep ancestral past. When he was 12, he was pushed by another boy, knocking him unconscious. As a result, Jung was unable to go to school for days because he fainted every time he remembered it. 
He spent six months at home. His parents thought he had epilepsy, a very common illness among many novelists such as Dostoevsky, Gustav Flaubert, Edgar Allan Poe, and many more. But at some point in his life, the fainting went away, almost miraculously. This opened up possibilities for the young Jung that he couldn't explain scientifically. During his teenage years, he started reading philosophy, particularly the German philosophers such as Immanuel Kant, Arthur Schopenhauer, and Friedrich Nietzsche. His family wanted him to become a pastor, just like his father. But Jung was interested in archaeology because he was interested in our deeper past. This was partly because his parents' domestic conflict made his present time unappealing and made him lonely, so he took refuge in the past. But partly due to an interesting family legend. Growing up, he would hear a family legend that his grandfather was an illegitimate son of the German literary giant Goethe. So he read Goethe's Faust when he was 15, which had a profound influence on him throughout his life. For those who don't know, Goethe's Faust is the story of a scholar who sells his soul to the devil for the unlimited knowledge and pleasures. The story has a deep Christian undertone that one has to resist the temptation of eating from the tree of knowledge because in Adam and Eve's story, Eve took a bite from the apple in the Garden of Eden, and as a result, humanity was exiled to Earth. So seeking knowledge is not always good from a religious perspective. Now Jung could see that same religious tale not only from a religious perspective but also from a literary perspective that had traveled through England in the work of Christopher Marlowe and in Germany in the work of Goethe. So he wanted to understand humanity's past through the science of archaeology. However, due to his family's financial situation, he couldn't relocate to another city to study archaeology, and Basel University didn't teach it. So he turned to his other interest, which was philosophy. But at the same time, he was also interested in something more scientifically concrete. So he finally settled on psychiatry and medicine, which combined biology and the human mind. While his family on both sides had strong religious ties and were even involved in occult activities, they were also involved in academic and scientific studies. So Jung grew up to harbor both ends of the spectrum: highly idealistic, or it could term belief-based disciplines such as the occult, alchemy, astrology, and religious studies, but also empirical and evidence-based science of psychiatry and psychoanalysis. Today, Jung is known to bridge the two supposedly irreconcilable traditions of beliefs and sciences: the rational and the irrational, the material and the spiritual. In 1896, he enrolled in Basel University to study medicine, graduating in 1900. He then moved to Zurich University, but also started to work at a psychiatry hospital with Eugen Bleuler, a renowned psychiatrist who was close contact with Sigmund Freud. From then on, Jung and Freud corresponded and later collaborated. Jung also worked with the French psychiatrist Pierre Janet, whose theory of the subconscious might have predated Freud's theory of the unconscious, resulting in a feud between Freud and Janet. In 1903, Jung published his thesis titled "On the Psychology and the Pathology of the So-Called Occult Phenomena." Arguing that epilepsy, hysteria, neurasthenia are different states of consciousness akin to occult phenomena experienced by a medium. His career as a doctor progressed rapidly, which allowed him to get married in 1903 to Emma Rosenbach, the daughter of a wealthy watch merchant who died two years later, leaving a huge fortune to the couple. But despite the wealth that his wife brought him, Jung continued to work hard, even opening his own clinic in 1909. It has also been alleged that Jung was sexually unfaithful, but despite his infidelity, the couple worked together not only inside, which produced five kids, but also outside. As a wife, also became an important psychoanalyst. In 1907, Jung met Freud, and for the next five years, they worked very closely with each other, often traveling together and reading each other's works before publication. They became so close that Freud called Jung his adopted son, his true heir. But in 1912, when Jung published *Psychology of the Unconscious*, their friendship was over. Freud believed that libido, the psychic energy associated primarily with sex, was the basis of a person's development. 
Jung, however, while believing libido to be the psychic energy associated with the unchecked bodily desires such as sex, hunger, thirst, sleep, and emotional needs, it was the collective unconscious, the past ancestral memories to be vital in a person's development. So while Freud emphasized sex, Jung on the other hand emphasized past ancestral memories to be vital in how a person develops personality. For Freud, the unconscious was like a storage where all the repressed emotions and desires are kept. Like a closet where you throw unwanted items in your house. Jung called it the personal unconscious, but there was this whole other storage which he called the collective unconscious, which Freud failed to realize or, or take into consideration. Also, Freud failed to see the unconscious as a dynamic repository as the personal memories collide with the collective memories. In other words, Freud focused on the individual while Jung also emphasized the collective historical baggage we all carry inside us. Jung analyzed the unconscious itself and broke it down to two, the personal and the collective, while Freud saw it as just one static realm. As a result, Jung's analytical psychology focused on the collective memory of distant past and your present situation, while Freud's psychoanalysis is primarily focused on your own individual past memories, urges, and emotions that were suppressed by you. The result of their breakup was tough for Jung, as everyone else too broke up with him due to the influence Freud as the father of psychoanalysis had at the time. In 1913, he experienced psychosis. It's important to note that he was 38 at the time, a crucial period in a man's life when what is considered a midlife crisis that a lot of men experience. Being a practical and scientific man, he wrote down his experiences of hallucinations, which he called active imagination in his black books, a series of notebooks which became the basis of his famous red book. In 1914, with the outbreak of World War I, forced Jung to be drafted as an army doctor. But it also came as a good distraction from his isolation after being ostracized by Freud and his friends. While Switzerland was a neutral country, it had to deal with soldiers from either side entering its territory. So Jung was working with the interned soldiers who were either lost or fled the enemy and even their own army. In 1921, he published Psychological Types, in which he discussed introversion and extroversion as personality types. For the next four decades, he continued to write and publish books while also traveling to many parts of the world, including Africa and Asia, which solidified his theory of the collective unconsciousness. He also gave lectures in Europe and America. As a result, he gained widespread recognition from universities, including those in the UK and the United States. He died in 1961, aged 85. Today, he is considered one of the greatest psychologists of all time. He is only second to Freud in terms of importance in the fields of psychoanalysis, but his contribution is far wider than Freud, specifically in the fields of anthropology, archaeology, literature, philosophy, psychology, and religion. His theory of the collective unconscious has been immensely relevant to literature and storytelling. Writers such as Hermann Hesse were influenced by Jung, specifically in his novel Steppenwolf, which I will discuss in a future video. He has also influenced great artists and musicians, among whom David Bowie, The Beatles, and even the Korean band BTS, not to mention movies, video games, etc. Apart from being a great psychoanalyst, he was also an artist, producing many great paintings as well as being a craftsman and a builder. For example, in the 1920s, he built the Bollingen Tower, a small castle where he lived for a few months every year as a kind of retreat similar to Heidegger's cabin inside the Black Forest to isolate himself in order to connect with nature. Jung also had some experiences in life that appear random and coincidental but turned out to be highly meaningful. This also influenced Wolfgang Pauli, the quantum physicist. Jung was interested in alchemy. His 1944 book, Psychology and Alchemy, saw a connection between the two. 
Just as alchemists were trying to turn lead to gold, psychoanalysts also help people to turn the unconscious into a higher level of consciousness through the process of individuation or fulfillment in life. Just as there are several stages of alchemical process, an individual also goes through a process of development to find their true purpose or fulfillment in life. Now I'll discuss Jung's core ideas. Collective Unconscious One of the most fundamental Jungian ideas is the collective unconscious, which refer to our collective memories passed down to us from our early evolution, only unique to humans, which other animals don't exhibit. While biologists and scientists argue that we all have universal instincts among all animal species, such as our survival instincts like hunger and security, as well as reproductive instincts of sexual urge, Jung argues the collective unconscious is very specific to humans. By collective unconscious, Jung meant our universal cultural memories, such as myths and characters that we can easily resonate with and understand. For example, no matter where you're born, you can recognize characters within a story, such as the hero or the villain, or even more specific archetypes, which I'll discuss later. The idea of collective unconscious probably goes back to Plato, the Greek philosopher who argued whoever or whatever exists in the real world are the many manifestations or mere shadows of an ideal form. In other words, the world in essence is not just the material world, but also a world of ideas or spirits or form, as he called it. We have a body as hardware, which is different for different people due to size, age and height, but we are all equipped with a certain level of software that makes us respond to myths and legends in almost the same way. Perhaps a crude analogy would be like this. Our biological makeup is our hardware, and our instincts for food and sex are like motherboards sewn into our biology just like an operating system. And our psychology is our software, which according to psychoanalysis is divided into two sections, the conscious, which is the tip of the iceberg, and the unconscious, which is hidden from us. While Freud was interested in the individual psychology, what went on inside their unconscious, their childhood, their inner struggles. Jung looked outside. He was interested in the commonalities that we all have, despite our cultural or religious differences. In other words, there are certain similar myths and symbols that all humans share, irrespective of their cultural backgrounds. While your own childhood experiences are stored in your own individual memory, the common myths and symbols are stored in what he termed as the collective memory, as part of the collective unconscious. These collective memories are not the result of our own individual experiences, but inherited from our distant ancestors that are passed down from generation to generation. Despite slight variation, these myths and symbols are more or less the same in all cultures. In other words, a large part of our psyche or conscious mind is filled by the memories of our ancient ancestors. Just as Freud provided dreams as an evidence for the existence of the unconscious, Jung too used dreams as evidence of the collective unconscious. In other words, our dreams are like windows into our past collective memories, be it the early humans or even apes who lived in trees or even farther in the past. Dreams are like bridges between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. For example, the dream of falling down from a high place might even take us back to ape-like ancestors who lived in trees. To really understand Jung's theory, we can look at it through philosophy. The Greek giant Plato thought everything that exists in the physical world are mere shadows of the form that only exists in the mind. In other words, the mind is primary and the outside world is mere shadow of that mind. Later in 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, rationalists believed that humans have an innate knowledge of the world. As babies grow up, this innate knowledge simply unfolds itself so that we make sense of the world. Carl Jung's theory of the collective unconscious is somewhat similar. We have inherited most of our unconscious memories and archetypes from our ancestors. In other words, most of our conscious mind is pre-assembled or pre-installed. 
A good analogy is an IKEA table. It's all ready, but we all have to put things together, connect the joints. It's the same with our myths and stories. As we read a novel or watch a movie, we keep connecting the dots. As we grow up, we simply unfold those memories to make sense of our personal experiences and build the persona of our own in the world. In other words, most of our psychology is given to us at birth. As we grow up, that psychology merely unravels itself in our unconscious to guide us through life. For better or worse, the inherited psyche or the collective unconscious determines a lot of our beliefs, experiences, emotions, and motivations. The only way out of this prison is to know it. Jung said, by understanding the unconscious, we free ourselves from its domination. So to sum up, while Freud argued that the unconscious, which includes collected memories, trauma, suppressed emotions from our childhood, determines most of our behavior and experiences in life, Jung went a step further saying that it's not just our own unconscious memories, but also the collective unconscious memories we inherit from our ancestors. So the unconscious is not just your own, but also those who came before us. Archetypes. In our collective unconscious, there are symbols and myths present in all cultures. Jung called these symbols and myths as archetypes that are molded inside us prior to our birth. Archetype, derived from archaeology, refers to a cultural artifact, archaic remnants, or primordial images fossilized in our unconscious mind, found among all people from different cultures, passed down from our earliest common ancestors, perhaps the early Homo sapiens, is therefore universal among humans. These archetypes are repeated characters present in all religions, mythologies, art, literature such as fairy tales, as well as epics and stories. In other words, archetypes are like templates for us to understand our own experiences in life. For example, we hear a story, we subconsciously compare ourselves to these characters and archetypes that are given to us. But interestingly, we are not aware that they are given to us. In other words, we are not conscious of these archetypes. We often think of them as somewhat naturally our own. Just as your genes are passed down to you through your ancestors as your hardware, so are these memories as your software. If your DNA is the memory of your genes, the archetypes are your collective cultural memories. If you go back to philosophy, Kant argued that our knowledge of the world comes through our experiences. But not only that, we have an innate mechanism of rationality that puts a structure onto the world. In other words, we are not passive receivers of knowledge from the outside world. We impose our own mental structure on the world as well. Jung's archetypes are somewhat similar in that. Through these archetypes and collective memory, we make better sense of our own experiences in the world. Archetypes sit in our own unconscious mind to give us patterns so that our experiences and emotions appear meaningful to us. Jung characterized the human psyche into three parts, the ego, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious. The ego is the rational or the conscious side of our psyche that regulates our lives. It's like control mechanism that tells us what to do in society, things not to do, and things that are acceptable to do. The personal unconscious, which Freud mainly focused on, includes our own individual memories, including repressed memories and suppressed emotions. The collective unconscious, which Jung mainly focused, is where the archetypes we have inherited from our ancestors are stored. What are the examples of these archetypes? Jung looked at one activity that we all have in common, storytelling. From a very early age, children are mesmerized by stories, and even adulthood we love stories. Why? Because stories are not only teach us, they have a deep emotional impact on us. In other words, stories teach us about the world, but also emotionally bond us with others. In fact, you could argue that most religions establish themselves through stories. Most tribes, communities, societies, and even empires were built upon stories and myths. Without a common myth, it's hard to unite an empire or a community. 
Jung found that storytelling is where archetypes live. For example, Jung gives us the wise old man, the wise old woman, the hero, the father, the mother, the devil, and so forth. If you look at myths and stories, you can find many of these archetypes throughout the world. Now you might think why these archetypes came about. The simple answer is in our evolutionary biology. As a living organism or animal, we face predators and prey. We face survival challenges. How we behave when we are faced with survival challenges defined our archetypes. So archetypes were sown into our genes because they allowed us to survive and pass on those genes to others. Archetypes are our survival instincts written in stories. That makes stories extremely powerful in our evolutionary history because a person may survive through his or her own ingenuity and resourcefulness, but a community needs a glue to bond all its members. How do you glue people together? Through stories. Stories and myths that raise the hair on your back. Stories that excite you. Stories that motivate you. Psychological types. Jung's psychological types of extrovert and introvert refer to personality traits to a degree of openness among individuals. To explain the two types, just like Nietzsche, Jung took us back to ancient Greece, where the two opposing gods, Apollo, the god of reason, and Dionysus, the god of wine and passion, balance one another. According to Nietzsche, Western philosophy and civilization suppressed the Dionysus, or human passion, in favor of rationality. But for Jung, these two gods represent two psychological types. Apollo symbolizes introversion, a reflective, dreamer, and thoughtful type who tries to gain insight and understand things, is therefore often solitary. Dionysus, on the other hand, symbolizes extroversion, who thrives among other people, prioritizing in the outside world sensory and sensual experiences and actions. Dionysus was the god of wine, so the extroverts are lively and passionate people who pursue fun activities with others. A great comparison between Shakespeare's character of Hamlet and Miguel de Cervantes' character of Don Quixote. Hamlet is reflective and a thinker, while Don Quixote is a doer. We all see bits of ourselves in both Hamlet and Don Quixote. Although in today's world, we are all to some extent curtailed from the freedom to be like Don Quixote, so we have all become a bit reflective and introverts like Hamlet. Persona versus Shadow Amid all the collective memories we inherit from birth, as well as our own personal unconscious, there seems to be a lot of chaos and confusion within us. Jung presents his idea of persona, which can mean personality as well as mask, to tell us that we are not passive with the memories in our personal and collective unconscious. In fact, we try to carve ourselves a neat little persona by which we want others to know us. A good analogy would be a career. We spend years in schools and universities to carve a career path for us, and finally, we become a teacher, a doctor, engineer, or YouTuber. Persona is a similar process in which the individual consciously as well as unconsciously display a persona to the world, guided partly through the archetypes, but partly due to our own personal memories within the culture we live in, and partly due to our own conscious mind. This persona is like a mask behind which we hide our collective psyche, but also display our own perceived individuality. You could say persona is a role we play on stage in the theater we call society. It's our role, our identity. A good analogy would be a shop window. They only show the best items on sale, not the half-rotten apples that are kept in the back. When we present ourselves to others, we are careful to show some bits and hide other bits. Not only that, we are also selective about what to show depending on where we are. We might take a different persona in the presence of a beautiful woman, who are we romantically interested in. But in the presence of our family members or friends, we put out a different persona altogether. The same when we go to a job interview. The Japanese have a concept called Hone and Tatemai. Hone means your true self or the one that you show inside your own home. 
Tatemai literally means outside the house, as a persona you show to others. They're vastly different. So for Jung, this public self is our own individual archetype, which we terms as persona. Of course, the persona is not totally conscious, it's mostly unconscious. But there's also a part that we don't want to show to the world. Jung calls it shadow, which is the opposite of the persona. For example, our weaknesses, shortcomings, urges, instincts that sit in the dark where do everything to hide them from others. These are our secrets and suppressed urges or thoughts that are unacceptable within our social environment due to religious or social values and norms. But also these traits come into conflict with our own personal values and norms. A good example of the shadow in storytelling would be the villain. And in religions, it's usually represented as the devil. We tend to associate the shadow with others and rarely with ourselves. The bad guys are always someone else and rarely ourselves. In Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, without us wanting it, we sympathize with Raskolnikov, a cold-blooded murderer. Not because we like him, but because we have that dark shadow within us. Given the right time and place, it might come out. So Dostoevsky understood the darkness we all have inside us. No matter how saintly you think you are, you also have the devil within you. Amid all these archetypes, Jung argued that our life's ultimate goal is to realize the true self, which is the most important archetype. Martin Heidegger called it authenticity which he argued can be achieved if we truly understand and accept death as the necessary condition of life. For Jung, finding the true self needs a lot of work, just like in Hinduism. It can only be achieved through consciously seeking it. This journey he called individuation, the process, as well as the ultimate purpose of a personal development in which an individual reconciles the conscious with the unconscious. It is somewhat similar to a hero's journey in which the hero has to sacrifice smaller things in life in order to become greater than himself or herself. Although for most people it comes through experience in life as we grow mature and gain wisdom, it can also happen through our own intervention and self-reflection. To do that we have to look into our unconscious self deeper inside us and understand our deeper urges, emotion and ancestral memories. In other words, the goal is for us to balance the persona with the shadow, in which neither has full control over us. The attempt to recognize and accept the unconscious and conscious. This is very similar to the Taoist idea of yin and yang balancing one another which incidentally influenced Jung quite a lot. Feminine and Masculine Two of the most important archetypes according to Jung are anima, the feminine part of a man's psychology and animus, the masculine aspect of a woman's psychology. According to him, on an unconscious level, men have the feminine and women have the masculine archetypes within them. In other words, we all have two personalities, the conscious gender roles and the unconscious archetypes. Why? The simple answer is to help us understand and deal with the opposite sex. For example, the unconscious feminine archetypes allow men to be soft and understand emotions and sympathize with others, while the unconscious masculine archetypes help women to be strong and more goal-oriented or outcome-driven. For Jung, recognizing our inner unconscious archetypes doesn't mean we have to confuse our gender roles, but to enhance our ability to deal with the other gender. A man should recognize the sympathetic, soft anima within him, but remain a masculine figure, while a woman should recognize the goal-oriented, strong animus within, but also stay feminine. Now I'll discuss the 10 lessons we can draw from Carl Jung's life and writings. Lesson 1. Don't restrict yourself to one discipline or belief. Quote, Intuition does not denote something contrary to reason but something outside of the province of reason. While Jung was educated or trained in the area of psychoanalysis, he looked beyond the discipline and in particular he studied literature and mythology. As we all know, the power of storytelling in our psychology is very strong. 
From a very early age, we are hooked on stories. Now, why is that? The simple answer is that stories must have had a great utility for our past ancestors. To put simply, stories are simply about other people's mistakes that we can learn from. Of course, the power of stories goes beyond the teaching aspect of it, but also it entertains us and keeps us focused and hooked on an idea or goal. So the genius of Carl Jung was to combine literature and storytelling on the one hand with psychoanalysis that was developing at the time in the German-speaking world. Since our DNA holds information on how our body develops, certain characteristics like hair, eye color, our height or build and so forth, our DNA also holds certain proclivities in us towards certain archetypes and stories. As I said in my video on Marcel Proust, creativity occurs when two different ideas or disciplines collide or combined. In the case of Proust, he combined evolutionary biology, intuitive philosophy with art, come with the beautiful insights. In the case of Jung, he combined storytelling and psychoanalysis to come up with the collective unconscious memories of certain archetypes. The reason we resonate with certain tales or characters is because it's passed on to us from our early ancestors. So to be creative is to look beyond your discipline, just like an artist who walks back and forth while painting. It is creative to look outside your own discipline. Lesson 2. Think, not judge. Quote, Thinking is difficult, that's why most people judge. When you look at Carl Jung's interests, one might be puzzled or even confused. He was a serious psychologist, a scientist, you could say, and of course, a therapist. But he was deeply interested in areas that might be considered pseudoscience. His interest in alchemy and paranormal psychology might sound unscientific or even irrational. But Jung didn't judge those disciplines for how other scientists saw them. He instead asked himself this question, let's say they are pseudosciences, but why have they persisted in the human imagination for such a long time? As an open-minded and curious man, he wanted to find answers rather than dismissing things at face value. This same can be said about myths and legends. One can easily dismiss them as nothing but fiction or figments of imagination. But then Jung asked himself, how come we are drawn to myths and legends? And how come we invented such myths and legends in the first place? So the lesson is, do not dismiss something without really getting to the bottom of it. Instead of judging something as irrational or pseudoscientific, it's better to explain them and find answers as to why we have had alchemy or why parapsychology has existed in the first place. In other words, sometimes our, your prejudice can be your worst enemy in getting an insight or pushing things forward. We are superstitious. The most rational people still believe in some form of superstition be it in their sports team winning a game, if they did certain things, or while betting money on something. We all have phobias, irrational fears. For instance, fear of snakes is like some deposited memories of past traumas in places where there is no snake at all. So think before judge. Lesson 3. Learn from others. Quote, the meeting of two personalities is like the contact of two chemical substances. If there is any reaction, both are transformed. In the German-speaking world, the practice of apprenticeship is very strong. Even today, most young Germans go through a period of apprenticeship in order to learn the craft from someone hands-on. Of course, the education system has made it easy for everyone to learn things in schools, therefore the need to learn trade on the job has become less popular. But there is no substitute for learning from someone on the job. So Jung spent years becoming a disciple of other psychoanalysts such as the Swiss psychiatrist Eugen Bleuler, Pierre Janet, and of course Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis. It's very important that one has a few close mentors to learn from. Today, a lot of people dismiss the past and those who came before. If there's one thing we can learn from history is that we should learn from and appreciate those who came before us and try to make use of most of their knowledge and wisdom. Friedrich Nietzsche, the most individualistic philosopher, makes his Ubermensch heroes go through a camel stage during which they toil like a camel to learn their craft and only then can they become the lion that roars.
So learn from your teachers, mentors, and parents, and then you're able to find what they lack. Quote, the true leader is always led. Lesson 4. Take notes. Jung left behind a ton of pages of notes, journals, and diaries. He wrote down his memories, dreams, and even his experience of hallucinations. Our memory is pretty unreliable. If you think about philosophy, we only know the philosophies or stories of those who wrote them down. Human thoughts and philosophical insights prior to writing is quite unknown. Not because they didn't have a philosophy or stories, it's because they left no written words behind. So writing has power, and when you write things down, not only do you feel unburdened, but they also give you great ideas and insights into your own personality and mind. So one way to understand oneself, one has to take notes and write down memories and experiences. Self-knowledge is perhaps far more difficult than we might think. So keeping a journal is a good way to find cues as to what makes you really tick beyond the daily grind or social media. So take notes because it takes you deeper into yourself. Lesson 5. Tell your story. Quote, the reason for evil in the world is that people are not able to tell their stories. Psychoanalysis as a discipline is also sometimes called the talking cure. But it's more than just talking, it's telling stories. Telling your stories. If journaling is a good way of unburdening yourself from some deep and difficult thoughts and experiences, telling your story for others to read is perhaps a step further. Now you are writing for an audience. You are formulating your thoughts into a coherent tale. Jung understood the power of myths and storytelling in our collective evolutionary past. But the same thing applies to the individual. Your story can shed light on your own past. For a lot of novelists and storytellers, or even artists, writing or telling a story or creating a piece of art is a process of discovery. As you tell your story, you go on a journey of self-discovery. Lesson 6. Art is therapy. Quote, Art is a kind of innate drive that seizes a human being and makes him its instrument. To perform this difficult office is sometimes necessary for him to sacrifice happiness and everything that makes life worth living for the ordinary human being. Not only in psychotherapy, art is often used to treat patients, but philosophers such as Arthur Schopenhauer and Friedrich Nietzsche, and of course Carl Jung, saw art as an antidote to suffering. Schopenhauer argued that music was the only escape from our human condition of perpetual suffering. Nietzsche put art as an antidote to nihilism as it gives us the ultimate purpose in life. Jung observed how art was healing for his trauma patients and alleviating their anxiety and fear. Today, not only dance and music, but also storytelling and creative writing are used to cure many patients of mental illnesses. Just as civilizations survive and thrive on myths and stories, on a personal level, we also survive and thrive on stories, arts, and crafts. We all know the best storyteller in our family. You feel close to them. They stay within the collective memories of those who heard them tell stories. Our persona is our story we tell the world, consciously, but also unconsciously. The shadow, however, is the story we never tell anyone. Only great novelists are able to tap into their shadow worlds to connect with the collective unconscious and tell inside and psychological tales. Dostoevsky was such a great novelist whose psychological tales terrify but also reveal something deeper inside us. Lesson 7. Discipline leads to enlightenment. Quote, I have observed that a life directed by an aim is in general better, richer, and healthier than an aimless one. And it's better to go forwards with a stream of time than backwards against it. There is sometimes a misconception that those who are enlightened or have achieved a fulfilling life are often passive, peaceful, tranquil, and inactive people. Life at its core is a struggle. Everything is achieved through struggle. The same can be said about meaning and enlightenment. It's through individual strive and hard work that one can achieve meaningful life for himself or herself. Jung says, Why are you looking around for help? 
Do you believe that help will come from outside? What is to come is created in you and from you. Hence, look into yourself. Do not compare. Do not measure. No other way is like yours. All other ways deceive and tempt you. You must fulfill the way it is in you. So in order to become someone, one must suffer through the trials and tribulations of his or her own actions. Quote, we must make mistakes. We must live out our own vision of life. If you avoid errors, you do not live. In a sense, even it may be said that every life is a mistake, for no one has found the truth. We are only liberated if we go through the arduous journey of life. No guru or leader can liberate you. It is only you who can carve a unique path for yourself. That means one has to act and be disciplined in it. Nobody can become a great artist overnight, and the same is true about fulfillment in life. Quote, Real liberation comes not from glossing over or repressing painful states of feeling, but only from experiencing them to the full. Lesson 8. Embrace your darkness too. Quote, what you resist persists. We often escape our dark thoughts and experiences. This is at the heart of psychoanalysis, that we suppress unsavory emotions and experiences from our consciousness and push them down into unconscious realm. Jung says one must understand his dark side before he can deal with other people. Quote, knowing your own darkness is the best method for dealing with the darkness of other people. When you read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, the common reaction is to side with a murderer. We get terrified when Raskolnikov is about to confess. We want him to get away with the murder. Why? Because we understand him. We understand him in us. He was a poor student in need of money. Not just that, he's a very good at justifying his actions. Not just that, he's also clumsy like an average Joe, and also he's extremely tormented on the inside. All these emotions make us side with the murderer. Jung says that's what humans are. We are neither saint nor evil. We are a bit of both. Unless we fully understand and embrace our dark side, we cannot become good. Understanding and embracing our darker side makes us strong. It is through sheer strength we can be enlightened. Weak people cannot be enlightened, so escaping from our darker thoughts and emotions is not the answer. It is time to embrace the fact that we are dark and light at the same time. Quote, I don't aspire to be a good man. I aspire to be a whole man. Lesson 9. We are all connected. Accepting humans as animal has been extremely difficult for the religious people for the past few centuries since Charles Darwin. The Europeans developed sophisticated science that challenged the religious dogma that God created humans and then kicked them out of the Garden of Eden. But because of centuries of religious indoctrination of human exceptionalism had seeped so deep in the culture and psyche that it was difficult for many Europeans to accept that they were the same as other races, let alone descend from apes. So Jung's attempt to find a missing link between all humans, not on a biological level, because the biologists had already accepted it, but also on a mythological level. So his collective unconscious theory that we all share the same stories and myths irrespective of our cultures proved that humans come from a common ancestors. So this connected all humans on a psychological level. Now we couldn't say one race was better than the other, and God favored one race than the other. In other words, the term human connection is real and deeply psychological. Lesson 10. Productivity is as important as creativity. One of the major criticisms against Carl Jung is that he focused too much on the internal human problems and less on the external struggles like how to survive in the real world. In other words, Jung focused on the creative types, the artists, the novelists, the musicians, etc., while ignoring the productive types. In society, we need both. Creative people come up with great ideas, inventions, and solutions to the problems, but ultimately it's the productive type of people who make things happen or achieve something and do the work. So this also applies within an individual. If we solely focus on being a creative mind, 
and not having done something with that creativity is a waste of time. So the trick is not just to be a creative genius, but also someone who turns that creativity into something. Carl Jung spent years and years writing down his ideas and theories. I'm sure there were people who may have had similar insights, but we only know of those ideas if someone took the trouble of writing books, publishing papers, and conducting research. The same is true with you. If you want to become a writer, you must write. If you want to be a YouTuber, you must make videos. So a good balance between creativity and productivity leads to success. I'll leave you with this quote. The fact is that each person has to do something different, something that is uniquely his own. Thank you very much.